So hold on. So it's coming from Australia. It's coming from New Zealand, but they're able to call it an American product because a lot of these companies, and again, we're not going into any mm-hmm. names specifically, but they say U.S. based. Well, the company could be U.S. based, but for instance, if you're selling burger and the laws are changing, the good news is they're changing some of these laws. So shortly- Dude, we all have the best time ever to start a small business. If I'm not going to be 100% in, I'm not going to do it. Come on, man. Just be yourself. Yeah. And, like, and just show up as yourself. If you don't realize what I'm really about, I'm about freedom, family, and my country. Awesome. Jeff, cheers. Cheers, Ryan. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for the Yeti cup, man. Of course. It's got the CCB. Yeah. I thought it said CCP to the beginning when I was a little nervous. No, I feel we'd be kicked out of Colorado for that. Do so. they have beef in China? Yeah. They do? Yeah, I mean, the good beef, they still have to import, but they do produce their own. Yeah. They're mainly known for producing pork, though. They have a huge percentage of the international pork really? production. Yeah. Is it any good? I mean, if you're eating pork, there's a big chance it came from China. Yeah, I don't eat pork. Right. Smart. I stick to the beef. Take what wins. So, Jeffrey Smith? Yeah. Does anybody call you Jeffrey? Whatever you want to do, man. Born and raised in Oregon. Mm-hmm. Um, father and mother working hard. Mom owns a little real estate business. Yeah, mom, they've actually both retired. So, mom, I helped mom sell the company like six years ago. Uh, dad was a DOD SWAT guy, Navy veteran from Vietnam. Uh, he retired three years ago. So, dad's pretty badass. Dad's pretty hardcore. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's funny when you talk as a parent to your parents, it gets weird. Yeah. And he, I told him one day, I said, you know, you taught me how to work and that's the best thing you could ever taught me. And he got a little emotional emotional, and he goes, son, that's the only thing I knew how to teach you. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, that thing did pretty good. That yeah. landed. So. Yeah. That's deep. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably like what I do to my kids. Dad, what you taught me is how to say fuck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, yeah, if you do it in the right context. Yeah, my kids do it in really in the right context, and they don't do it at school or in church or anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, so today I want to take the time in this podcast, and I want to give nuggets to our viewers. Sure. So a few things I want to talk about is quickly your background, right? Um, help people understand where you came from so they can say, hey, I walked a similar path to Jeff mm-hmm. and his wife and what they're doing. And then I want to walk through what it looks like to have this concept and this vision and then how you take it to investors, mm-hmm. right? Because so many people say, I have this idea, but I got no money. But real, realistically, if you're a small guy that wants to flip some houses, somebody with some money in your neighborhood is more than likely willing to bet on you if you're doing the hard work and the homework and showing them what they can earn on this rate of return. Sure. Just to keep it simple. And then I want to end with where you think the future of beef is going and what's going on with the beef supply in this country and the world. Yeah. Sound fair? Sounds solid. Awesome. So we said Oregon raised. You then did well in school throughout high school, elementary? How'd you like school? Man, I was the best underachiever ever. So I was really fortunate to be able to sit down and crack out a book for 20 minutes and go get a B on a test. Mm. I uh, had a very good memory, and that's the only reason I got through college. Uh, I was the first person in either one of my parents' families to go to college. Worked 30 to 60 hours a week all through college, but luckily didn't have to study that much. That's what really saved my bacon. Mm. Uh, so I would say I was a good student. I tested well, but in comparison to the amount of work that like even my younger sister had to put in or some of my friends, I was very blessed in the fact that I could pick something up and run with it. I didn't have to learn it that tightly. What do you think that is attributed to? Just the way your brain is made up, how you learn, how you retain? Man, I don't know. Um, my mom and dad told me- Cause I'm the complete opposite. Oh, uh, my mom and dad told me a story that they started me with flashcards when I was like three. And I've always been a numbers dork and just been able to retain information really, really well. And to the point even my wife's like, why would you know that? That's just really weird information to have in your brain. But I haven't forgotten our anniversary, so I get a pass. Mm-hmm. Um, but my mom and dad told me that when I went to kindergarten, like within two weeks, I was bored because I had already done all the flashcards. And so I don't know what to attribute it to. I think some of it's just luck of the draw. Do you think um, it was like the, that repetition young with your parents with the flashcards? Maybe. Um, I think I just, I got fortunate. 
is all I'd really know how to say. But you know what I've turned that into in business is just finding your strengths. Yeah. Let's not go there yet, though. Yeah. Younger <laughs> Jeff, elementary, middle school, high school, troubled kid. You behaved. You listened. I behaved pretty well. Um, I was kind of a nerd, but it was okay because the guys gave me a lot of hell. I was like, yeah, one day you'll work for me. It'll be okay. Mm. Uh, did you have that thought in your head? By the time I got to high school, I did. It was a chip. It, sounded, it was building a chip. A little bit. Um, my parents never let me like have a nine to five job where somebody could tell me when to come to work. So by the time I was a senior in high school, I was mowing 50 or 60 lawns a week. I had three of my buddies that work for me doing other jobs. We'd build fence, we'd tear down trees, we'd do whatever. What were your revenues back then? <sighs> Enough to pay for gas and all the bad decisions <laughs> I wanted to make. Quads, <laughs> little BB guns, uh, Going cards. to the mountains, you know, growing up in Eastern Oregon, the mountains are 30 minutes away. So, you know, probably could have been better at saving early on. So from a, a guy out here on the East Coast, you know, our mountains are Wyndham, Vermont, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Adirondacks, which is, I think the top mountain is 8,000 mm -hmm. feet. Um, much different out on the West Coast. But what I think about Oregon is just like liberal state, um, and I don't mean that in any type of like bad way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, farmland, you know, describe to us a little bit more what it was like to you as a kid growing up. Yeah, so a lot of people, when they think about Oregon, it's like, oh, man, it rains a lot. And that is the western third of the state. So from the Cascades west, it rains a ton. And agriculture is incredibly prevalent. So in a typical county in the Multnomah Valley, you're going to have 200 crops in a county. Everything from Christmas trees to blueberries and the second. Hey. Yeah, hay, but but not not as commoditized as you would think of in other parts of the country. Like the biggest uh, ag commodity in Oregon at one point was Christmas trees. The second largest was nursery plants. Mm -hmm. So flowers and just very untraditional agriculture. And does that ship all the way across the country yeah. or it's just mainly the West Coast? Yeah, and then grass seed is huge in the valley as well. So, you know, as a person that's traveled a lot, like my background, I really became an agricultural industry expert. Mm -hmm. Like what happens in a region? How does that region feed another region? And that's really where my career reached a genesis point of moving around is being able to find all those ways that interconnected back to how I was in school. I could kind of put the puzzle together as yeah, I Which makes sense in your job before what happened, which we'll get into that. I don't yeah. want to tell that story yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think about Oregon and it's like, you know, you also have, you know, the ocean side. Yeah, which, so that's where it's, where it's really rainy. I grew up on the opposite side of the state where it's high desert. It's rocks, it's sagebrush, it's relatively mountainous, so there's not a lot of peaks. Like the summit of the Blue Mountains is 4,200 feet or so. Oh, so it's the Catskills. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. not crazy, but you go from 1,200 to 4,200 really Correct. quickly. Yeah. Uh, nothing like Colorado or anything like that, but if you go an hour north of where I grew up, you're in the Walla Walla Valley, which is a massive winery region. Mm -hmm. So it's just very diverse as an area. And yeah. then you have the Columbia River there. So it's there's so many different geographical things that affect society. It's kind of bizarre to explain to people that haven't been out there. Yeah, it gets deep. Yeah. So you go through elementary school, high school. You're somebody who's able to study well. You consider yourself a, a nerd. You go off to Colorado State. You do well there. What was your studies in so I got out of junior college in Oregon and then transferred. And I got a deg uh, bachelor's degree in agriculture business with minors in finance and accounting. With the only understanding in my head being, I'm good at math, I don't like ag. Mm -hmm. If you put a dollar sign in front of that, maybe that's marketable. And started to parlay that right out of school. What were you looking at to, that made you like think that way at 21 years old? Just that married those two together because that's not a thought in mm -hmm. most people's head. Nowadays, it would be, but. There wasn't really a process other than I want opportunities. What can I put together to give me the most processes to run through? And that was literally as deep as it went See. because I didn't want to go animal science. Other ag pursuits would be 
agricultural engineering, soil and crop sciences, animal sciences, and those are all very vertical. Mm. And I said, man, I want as many opportunities to branch as I can. And that's really as far as the decision tree went until three months before school got out when I started looking for jobs. So how do you thought, or how do you think you thought that way at that age? Because most people who are coming out of college or let's just say they've been working dead end jobs or hard labor, saving up money. Now they're 21 years old. They want to go into some type of business or they're leaving college. Like, how did you think I want all those branches to be able to spread out my wings and maybe have all these different opportunities was that just some, did you have some guidance? Was that just intuitive? I don't know that I had any real guidance on that. There's one thing that sticks in my mind right before I left Oregon to go to Colorado. Uh, my dad who retired with 42 years of federal service. I was working for Walmart in their distribution network making $23 an hour at 20 years old. And my dad said, you need to stick with this. It's a good corporate job. Like take the money and I was like nah, I think coming from a cop yeah I mean all love uh, dad yeah SWAT guy and he's like yeah you gotta you got a steady paycheck and I was like I think there's something bigger and I don't know that there was a thought process that said this is what I get to but I was like hey man what gives me the best jumping off point and so I want to stop on dad for a second yeah and dad's a hard worker dad loves you dad loves to see your success that you and your wife are having now with the ranch but a lot of times our parents like build our limiting beliefs mm -hmm. and it's very hard to challenge that they teach us our religion they teach us our thought process on money they teach us how to vacation they teach us how to eat they teach us how to be physically fit or not right we we get all of these beliefs from our parents because mm -hmm. that's who we spend the most time with and we look up to mom and dad what helped you break out of that thought process of dad saying, hey, stay at Walmart versus the way that you were thinking? There's something I've talked to a lot of the younger people I've coached and things like that. And I said, you know, you can get twice as many lessons in life as you focus on what you want and what you don't want to learn from somebody. And love my dad. He worked hard. He did the very best he could. I don't mean this in a derogatory way. But in a lot of ways, I learned what I didn't want. Mm -hmm. from those same people. You learned the good and the bad. Yeah, so I learned that I didn't want to be beholden to money or a vacation schedule or... It's misery. It's not freedom. Yeah, and so I, I learned what I didn't want. Same as finding my wife, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I dated some girls, and I was like, well, that's absolutely not where I'm after. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really where it came from. You know, yeah. growing up, we were never poor. I had everything I needed. But going on vacation was a financial decision. Yeah. Uh, buying a new pickup was a financial decision. It was a massive deal. And I didn't want that hamstringing and thing. And you remembered in that as a young kid, right? 100%. Yeah, it sticks in you. Yeah. So as much as I learned from them of what to do, I had some things that I said, well, I absolutely don't want that. So as a nugget for a young guy or girl watching this podcast, or, or someone even in their 30s that haven't decided exactly what they want to do in life, and they have a mom or dad saying, ah, take that job with the pension. Mm -hmm. Take that job as a teacher. You know, yep. you would say to them, look at your parents and say, are they living the way that you desire to live? And if they are, and that's the simple life you want to live, I don't hate on that. Yeah. That's not what I ever wanted. And the one caveat I would add to that, that I run into a lot of people that will say, I want X, I want Y, or I don't want that. What they will be very quick to say or judge is the guy that has the stuff they want without being willing to put in the work to get there. Yeah. And that's the hard one for me. Like, if you want whatever the value on a place is, you, you want the eight to five, you want no risk, by all means, I support that. Because what we do, <laughs> it's a little treacherous at times. Yeah. It can be a little sketchy. It's rocky. But the highs are awesome and the lows are freaking gut-wrenching. The best thing that a guy ever taught me was like, hey, Ryan, business is like this in the finance world. Yeah. He goes, learn how to stay here. Yeah. So when you crush a big case, stay here. Yeah. When you're not doing well, stay here. And that's something I always try to remind myself of. Like, great, I, I closed a, you know, multi six figure deal. Like, okay, you could have zeros for two months. Yeah. And just keep yourself on that steady eddy and understand the end goal that you're chasing, which is, you know, for me is, is financial freedom and making memories with my family. Yeah. And if you try to ride the wave, it'll smoke you at some point. Yeah. You got to have, you got to have an inner tube. 
to yes. continue the metaphor. But. 100%. Absolutely. So you left college. What did you go do? I got recruited by Cargill, which I don't know if anybody out here knows who Cargill is. Largest privately held company in the world at the time. 152,000 employees across the, across the globe. Wow. Very large agriculture producer. So I went to work for their grain division. So I ran... Uh, they're called shuttle trains, but it's basically export trains that mm -hmm. ship from the Midwest to the ports. And I would run facilities that we loaded shuttle trains with corn and soybeans. We shipped them to either New Orleans, we shipped them to Seattle. And I did that for a couple of years. Was that like a logistics job or you were just operations? operations? Yeah. It was heavy operations. What did it, you learn in that? Not as much as I think I could have. Mindset was a big part of that because I was young and didn't know anything, but it was just a job. I wouldn't say that. What did you learn on accident? Again, I learned what I didn't want. I had I had the job that I had the checkbook, but I didn't understand the revenue. Mm. I didn't understand the big enough picture. I didn't have the why. I had, you did know, Did the my, numbers start to sink in? You said you had the checkbook. That means were you paying oh, the bills out of that yeah, place? Yeah. So, like, my operating budget when I was in Minnesota at 23 was $8.5 million. So, did, did your brain start to think, like, bigger because of those numbers or did you think like this is a company that has 150,000 employees and that's why eight million dollars to them is is no big deal it wasn't that it was more the goal the the goalkeeping like oh we got to be here we got to be there how do you hit the targets it was very much a mechanical exercise mm -hmm. and the thing that burned me out in operations was there was no success you on the 5th of every month, you had to submit this report. On the 10th of every month, you had to submit that report. It's it doesn't America. matter if you had a win the week before. Mm -hmm. The corporate What did you do for me lately? Yeah. Uh, and then I transitioned from that job into capital project management, which was pretty heavy in operations as well, but there was a start and an end. So you start a new project. There's some new feel. You bid a new project. There's you a win budget. the job. Yeah. And you get multiple opportunities for success. And then you get multiple. What exactly were you doing? Because you could say that and someone watching is like, well, what does that mean? Uh, when I went into construction, we were doing a lot of heavy highway stuff. So I worked for a heavy construction company in Oregon. Uh, we had, this is a different company. Yeah, so I left Cargill, went back to Oregon. A friend of the family basically said, hey, I could use you. And I said, man, I don't know earthwork. And he said, I know earthwork. I don't know paperwork. Mm -hmm. So I was able to leverage that, that skill set. Yeah. Um, we were building offices. So would you consider yourself a paperwork guy or a vision guy? A little bit of both. So one of the skill sets I've developed that I really like to talk to people about, and some people can't do it, is the ability to zoom out and zoom in. Like, just think of an optic on a rifle. Mm -hmm. I can zoom into 20 and fix that problem. Or I can zoom out and move from that problem to another. Some people, I've worked with a lot of engineers in my career that can't do that. Yeah. They zoom in and, man, that, that zoom it's button they gets stay. stuck. Yeah. And that problem will just live in their brain. They don't, know, they don't understand concepts. Sure. They're, they're very uh, action-based. Mm -hmm. action well, it has to be an end goal. Yeah. I have to see that what I'm doing results in that, and that's just not how taking yeah. risks work. So what was fun for me in the construction world, we had like six crews. We're running seven or eight jobs. To me, it was a chess game. We're moving these machines to that job to make this guy happy, and we're bouncing over here. So you're running logistics. Logistics, operations. I was doing a lot of the contract work. I was, I didn't have to do any of the admin, which was awesome. Um, but the cool part was that was when I met my first mentor. And Bob Barton, I owe a ton of gratitude to that guy, and I've said it publicly a lot. We're still good friends. He would, for anybody that has employees out there, Metaphorically speaking, he would watch me walk to the edge of the cliff, grab the rope, tie a noose, put it around my neck, and jump. And he'd let me hang there for a minute, and he'd come get me and reel my dumb ass back up and say, okay, what'd you learn? And he would let me do that enough that I got to the point that I learned where the line was. I learned where to not overextend, where to not overcommit. And that is one of the things I am trying so hard to do with our team. Mm -hmm. And letting them walk to the edge and not reel them back immediately is the hardest lesson I've learned. Well, you have to if you're going to delegate, and mm -hmm. that's the hardest part when you are running a company and your investments in it, your heart, blood, yeah. sweat, and tears are in it, and now these people are taking your money, 
essentially because you're paying them mm -hmm. and they're going out and doing things that you need them to do to help for the success sorry about the ash no it's all and right really nice creased cowboy jeans i mean over there. these origin jeans are pretty legit origin eh? they need <laughs> to send me some jeans you got to tell pete and the boys you i know a guy it would be cool you know a guy tell him <laughs> the uh, i know he sees fireside yeah he's hit me with some likes there you go good they're uh good guys he's up in maine yeah i like maine yeah. kenny bunkport yeah they're they're hardcore yeah they are another jiu-jitsu guy yeah Jiu-jitsu is everywhere, man. It is. It really is. I need to get into it A bunch it of more. dudes wrestling in their pajamas. I'm not sure what that says, but... <laughs> it says your men. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're comfortable with that. Now you confuse me. Where were we? Uh, we were talking about Bob. Bob. So what is the most important thing besides, you know, having the line, showing you when to slow down? What was the most important thing he taught you personally? Man, it was like seven years or what did he instill in you personally so it was like seven years of an mba program so every time you thought you knew it you would come back to it and he owned the company yeah he, he was the owner and it was really interesting because how big of a company was it like in a mm, sense of revs? 30 employees uh not comfortable talking about rev since it was his company yeah but we had like 30 employees at the peak doing a lot of different projects the craziest part was watching him get more comfortable with letting me take over. I mean, there were contract negotiations we went into and like, hey man, let's go grab a coffee on the way because we're a signature away from a couple million dollar contract and he's not read any of the documents. Mm -hmm. And he would look at me and go, okay, fill me in. Yeah. That level of trust was something I had to build, but he also had to build that too. Yeah. And watching- It works both ways. Yeah, watching both of us mature together, um, him as a leader and me, you know, I've said this on other podcasts, like I had all the building blocks I needed. I just didn't know how to play with them right. Mm -hmm. And letting, watching him give me that latitude to figure that out and then him trusting me in return was incredible. And shrink that down to a small business owners. Let's just say 5 million of revs and below. Yeah. Or 2 million of revs and below. How does that transfer over to, let's just say even a retail store? And you're doing two million of revs, and you have a main manager that's running this, the retail store. Mm -hmm. You'll give some people an example of like what Bob did for you, and what's something they could maybe do for their manager. Because it's again, it's hard. Small business is like this is your life. Yeah. Blood, sweat, and tears, twenty four seven. I'm a business owner. This is my grind. It's a different grind than working for somebody, but yeah, this is everything. And I think control comes into a lot of situations and relationships, which you know hold people back from scaling i have a great example in our company i have wanted to go after employees and say hey i don't think you're performing well and bob taught me to hold back on that and make sure that my opinion and my emotion was founded in fact mm. like oh this person i don't think is performing well why and if i can't give myself the documentation to show that they're not performing my opinion is trash Mm -hmm. And the ability to look in the mirror and hold yourself accountable before using accountability as a leadership fail to hold somebody else to the fire that you can't hold yourself to was the hardest one for me. Yeah, extreme ownership. Extreme ownership, but also, like, I can think of some examples. Did I set that guy up to fail? Yeah. Was it my fault? Yeah. Well, and if I'm going to tell them they're not doing well, hey, Ryan, you're not doing well. You say, why? <laughs> I better have an answer. I better have a good answer. Yeah. Or what I'm doing is I'm burning leadership capital. You're not going to care next time I give you bad feedback. Yeah. But hey, man, here's the metrics you did two quarters ago. And the hard part in some of these small businesses, is you don't have metrics to track. Yeah. You don't have a real thing to talk about. You don't have a good dashboard that really understands all of it. A hundred percent. And I think that's the, the hard part with small business. Agriculture is a great example. We all have feelings and emotions about it, but we've not built the processes. So I spoke at an event a couple of years ago and we got an after event email from a guy that's exceptionally successful and done a couple hundred million dollars in different private deals, never used paper, always a handshake, which is admirable, but terrifying. Yeah. And he said, I never need private equity because the conversation was about private equity. He said, I never feel I'm gonna need private equity. Why should I use what you guys talked about? 
and I thought about it for a few hours and I emailed him back and I said, it's awesome you don't think you need private capital. But what I would say is if you were running your company like you needed private capital, you would probably find free money. If you don't have the processes in place that private equity is going to support or private equity is going to want to see, you're missing big chunks of your company. And one of those would be if you're running that retail store with two million in rev, you don't have processes and procedures to actually lean back and measure what people are doing. Well, a lot of times I think in small business, you're, you're, you're living out the cash register. Yeah. You know, you're like, hey, I got enough money to have my house. I got enough money to go on the vacations I want. Mm-hmm. You don't think about it as a, a future selling of the business to private yeah. equity or, or taking on private equity capital. Yeah. And most of us shouldn't. You should always build it as like, I want to keep this thing forever and it's the best thing that supplies mm-hmm. me an income stream. But uh, I, I'm guilty of that. Yeah. The hardest part about that though, if we think about that from a leadership standpoint, if you don't have a bigger purpose, and you're going to be upset with no that $20 that. an hour person to leave, to yep. go to a different job, you can't be upset with them. Yep. If they didn't have a purpose that you understood and you shared, they can't stay. And are you sharing it just in the numbers or in the vision too? It could be anything. There's a great book called The Great, or the, I think it's called The Great Game of Business. Could be misquoting that slightly. Uh, I know some companies have implemented that and they're sharing financials, they're sharing vision, they're giving people opportunities to contribute. Yeah, they make, it makes them feel like they're a real part of it. Yeah, and that's, I think, the small business mindset that gets lost is, well, I want to grow it for me, but then when the employee leaves, they're like, oh, that's some bitch, he's leaving. It's like, well, did you give him a reason not to? Employees are hard. Uh, you know, that that's, that's like the number one thing I hear from business owners. We do a lot of pension strategy, and we're helping tax mitigation, uh, a state strategy and, and, and the sales of business or succeeding it to the next generation. Mm-hmm. And the, the conversation in all three of those facets are employees. Mm-hmm. And my question always back to them is, are you incentivizing them right? Yeah. Are you putting golden handcuffs on, on the top people? Are you giving them things that make them feel like they're in a good environment? And a lot of times as humans, we all forget about this. And we read it in probably every business book is like, People want to feel like they're a part of something. Yeah. So are we doing a good enough job conveying the vision and are they aligned with that vision? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's tough, you know? The I, workforce out there is annoyed, frustrated, broke. Yeah. Um, well, and some people economy. are just gonna be employees forever mm-hmm. and they're gonna move and that's okay too. Like, it's part uh, of the game. I had one of my private equity guys that I was talking to the other day. I said, man, this just frustrated with employee stuff, whatever it may have been. And he goes, yeah, uh, get used to that. He said, because every problem in business, if it's not strictly financial, meaning there's no cash in the checkbook, is human based. Mm -hmm. It's either you're lacking training, you have the wrong butts in the wrong seats, but it's all human based. Are you a fan of EOS? I am, we aren't quite big enough to get there, but we're getting there. Yeah. So. It was interesting for me to hear him say that because we've all heard, you know, people on the bus, people on the boat, whatever the metaphor is. But his comment was like, no, if it's not very clearly strictly financial, it's always a human problem. And if it is financial, but you have the human element of them buying into where you're going, they're willing to take a little bit less of pay for the future of the company and where you're going and what that means to them and their lifestyle. Yeah. And that's something I've been good at doing is, is giving a vision to people. Hey, where we're we going, even with this fireside ecosystem and the pit, our mastermind and everything that we do inside my financial company is like, hey, this is where we're going. This is where we're, are you on this bus? Mm-hmm. Are you not on this bus? And when I've had less dollars to, you know, divvy out to people, I've been able to say, hey, we're going here and you're going to be all right. Yep. Do I have your loyalty? And that's it's, it's hard. Well, asking for that's probably really hard. right? It is. Yeah, it is. But when you're a small business owner and funds are limited and a lot of small business owners watch this, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to do, right? You, you're restricted with capital, mm-hmm. you know, how do I get them on board? And that takes a leader to cast a vision and then execute on that going forward. Because if you could keep saying that for, you know, seven years and nothing changes in their pocket, nothing changes in their life, then 
most likely they're they're going to be transient and they're on to the next company. What do you think that timeline actually is? Because seven years, I think, is super generous. Yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think it's months? 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's 18 <laughs> months. Yeah, because that's the hard part. 18 months in a startup, yeah, it's not that long. Yeah, like especially if you're dumping capital, growing, you know, that has to be part of your strategy. So, here's the hard part in my head, and and I think it's the difference between the employee mindset and the entrepreneur or business owner, is they see all of these funds coming in, they see uh, all of these people you're sitting with that are wealthy. And they just relate that to, you know, Jeff and Ryan are living high on the hog. And, yeah. You know, they're crushing it. And, and Patrick Pet David, who I've sat down with one-on-one, uh, me, Chris, and my friend Mike Zussman went out to see Patrick for the whole day. Something that he said that really stuck with me recently on the podcast. He was like, dude, I'm the, like, last guy paid. I am the least guy paid. I've made the most money when I'm, like, the number two and three guy in a company. Hmm. Because the cost, the investment of marketing, the investment of technology, especially nowadays, is so rampantly high, like for it to be extremely profitable to me is the exit on the back end that may never come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And you're having all of those emotions as a leader in your head and the employees going, what the fuck did you pay me? Yeah. And uh, a little advice for employees who may watch this, like, you know, believe in the leader and like have his back a little bit like that person's under a lot of pressure yeah if you've seen elon had a deal he talked about and i'm paraphrasing horribly but it was something like in a startup as a ceo you're walking on glass or no walking on hot coals chewing on glass looking into the abyss because every problem could end your company yep and every problem you get is the problem nobody else wanted because it all trickles down and it's the shittiest level of problems because nobody else wanted to deal with them and i was like i saw that and i was like man there's a pity party and a half but he's not wrong yeah i mean it's it is a constant grind and i think you're right like oh hey you talk about record revenues everybody starts going sweet where's my cut i'm like hold on yeah, here's record what it revenues and record expenses. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and that's what most people don't realize. And then you have, you know, investors. Yeah, which which you have in your company, and uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and sure. we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into how the whole Colorado craft beef came about with you and your wife, and then what that vision was, and then how you made that come to life. Cool. Cool. All right, jumping back in. Yeah. So. You meet your wife. It was 10 years after college. Yep. We talked about that at dinner. Yep. That was Charlie's of Bayhead, by the way. It was outstanding. It was good. Yeah. The fish is more fresh at the ocean than it is in the plains of Colorado. Everybody should be surprised by that. Right? I hope so. <laughs> I hope it is. So you meet your wife 10 years out of college. Where did you meet her? And what's your wife's name again? My wife's name is Kara. Kara. Yeah. So. Hi, Kara. Yeah, we got. I got invited through some mutual friends, and a bunch of us went to dinner in Idaho before we went to a concert. And Kara happened to be one of the girls that showed up in that group. And about three months later, I got her to actually go on a date with me. She turned me down like three times, but hard to get. No, she's just smart. I just wore her down. <laughs> <laughs> That's your sales background. That's right. So persistency. I mean, I I think I said it at dinner. Like, if you're gonna get married, be the ugly one and marry up. So, yeah. took care of that. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. What was she doing at the time? She had just left working for the University of Idaho. Um, she was about a year out of grad school, so she carries a master's degree in cow nutrition, which parlays into the beef company really well. Uh, she is the fifth generation rancher. Uh, so she was the beef quality assurance coordinator for the University of Idaho. And then right as we met, she transitioned into the pharmaceutical world for the beef industry. Mm. And then she did that until 2022 when she went full-time with our companies. That's crazy. Yeah. What were you doing? You were still working for the road department or road company? No, I left the construction company right after we met. And I went to work for a company in the Bratney companies out of Des Moines, Iowa. And I put all my construction and ag knowledge together and started as a technical sales manager for processing companies. So in like verticals I worked within within that company was the hops industry, the beer industry. I worked in cat litter factories, 
uh, gunpowder factories, a ton of different seed factories and like ag production, flour milling, uh, nut factories. I worked in pistachio factories in California and pecan factories in Texas and just all sorts of weird stuff. Um, what were you doing for them exactly? I was an equipment sales manager. So a good example is Coors would call and say, hey, we have this problem. You need to come look at it. And they would say, so from this spot to this spot, these processes happen. We're jamming up. What's that? We're jamming up. or they're mis- Yeah, they'd say these processes happen. We don't like this result. How do we fix it? And I would get with our engineering team and I would come back with three or four different variables of what to fix. Typically, hey, here's the $100,000 fix and you need three more people or you know, all the way up to here's the $2 million fix. You need two less people on this same production floor. So this company was mainly consulting. Consulting, for all of these different consulting, we sold the equipment and we had an engineering and construction division. Mm-hmm. So then I would parlay the equipment sales into potential construction. Obviously, not with Coors, they had their own people. Uh, <clears throat> but with smaller companies or bigger projects like Land Lakes, we did some big alfalfa seed projects for, uh, or flour milling. It just kind of depended. But you had to be really good at talking to those people to understand their needs without trying to pull the used car salesman move like oh you're going to buy this you need to buy these three things and you built a relationship that i think in a lot of sales roles maybe not in the financial world because you guys provide a lot of value add uh, in ag especially there's not a lot of sales roles where you're adding value like uh, chemical salesmen Mm -hmm. they're referred to as chemistry salesmen Mm -hmm. this guy sells the same as that guy it's all price based there's no value add so we were doing a lot of value add. Um, Hoping for the sale on the back end. Um, kind of. I mean, that was the play, but really the big hope was that when they called and they had a big capital project to do, there wasn't a lot of recurring revenue. It was every 10 years, this company is gonna spend four to $8 million. How do you get a chance to swing the bat on that project? Mm-hmm. And if you miss it, it's a zero. Yeah. It's all commission based. Um, there was some re- recurring revenue, but it wasn't like an account management role. It was very, very. So your sale, pro- your sales process was ten years. How'd you make money? Because you had a hundred clients, you were yeah. constantly revolving, you were building relationships. Uh, I can think of one plant in Nebraska. I sold them a bunch of equipment because I knew a guy in Washington that wanted the equipment we were pulling out. Mm-hmm. So they said, if you can get us this much money for the equipment we're pulling. And they all knew it, and I let them handle the transaction independently so I didn't get paid on it so I could sell the other gear. Mm -hmm. But it was about doing good business, not more business. I talk about this all the time on the podcast. You get paid to do the things that you don't get paid to do. That's right. So you're adding value, you're putting these people together, they're creating a transaction, which in the end hopefully lands with you. And then they're gonna talk to the other people in their industry because every industry is way smaller than you think it is. Uh, I did that until 2019. What did you learn most from that job? To keep a cool head. So I mean, again, just some you know emotions. Yeah, in the construction industry, especially doing government level work, you walk around with boxing gloves on every day. You're arguing about money. Yeah, you you're walk f- into a room, it's like. Pfft. Yeah, you're fighting about contracts. It's lowest common bidder. It's just super competitive and very emotional. And you know, for guys to drop an f bomb and scream at each other was just a Tuesday. It didn't yeah. matter. You couldn't do that in other industries. And frankly, the way construction has evolved. You can't do that now yeah. with ESG scores and everything else. If you want some of these big projects, it's it doesn't fly anymore. ESG, you think that's something that's going to stay around for a long time? And do you think it actually helps the, the, the big picture? I think ESG, in theory, is potentially helpful. Economically, I think it's a bust. And I think it's a crutch for big companies to lean on to try to overshadow some of the crap they're doing that they get away with. Yeah, it seems like the the largest investment funds like like BlackRock and Vanguard have like their own index to grade larger companies on where they're at from an ESG perspective. And I look at it in my personal opinion as it's like all politically driven. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's tenable economically. Yeah. And sooner or later, the math has to work. So... If you're, gonna, if you're a company that wants to be successful, it has to work. Yeah, or you have to be so big, you can just absorb it, 
roll the price onto somebody else. But sooner or later, you think the that, but like the car companies are pretty big, and all of them are saying like we're fucking done with these electric cars because it's just like not economically working out for us. We yeah, well, look at the grid, right? The grid can't handle it. Yeah. So it's it's something else I talk to with some of the people in our company or some of our investors. It's you hear some of the military guys talk about second, third level effects. Like, oh, if we hit this target, it causes these problems. If we mess up this area, this other area is gonna be a problem. Second and third levels, baby steps in my opinion. You know, it's it's fourth, fifth, sixth level that really starts to make things happen. And that's one of the things I think some of those big companies don't have to pander to quite as much mm -hmm. because they aren't as nimble, right? They're, have you heard the starfish metaphor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're too big in the middle. They can't move that quickly, but they're so big they're gonna survive. Yeah. Companies like mine, we have long arms, we're very mobile, and if the center gets too big, you get smashed. Yeah. So you, it's, it's a scale concept that yeah. I think ESG applies to the people that the scale doesn't really apply to anymore. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna be around for forever. I don't believe so. Yeah, maybe in some form or fashion just to maybe make some people happy, but. yeah. It's not going to be there. So you and your wife meet at that point. Mm -hmm. When do you guys start discussing taking over her family ranch? So we still haven't taken over the ranch. Uh, Kara's dad still runs the commercial ranch. Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we moved back to the family ranch. Do you have ownership in nope. the company? No. Everything we did is totally bootstrapped. Totally bootstrapped, totally independent of company finance or family finances. So what does the, what does the family do in the sense of the ranch is still selling you the cattle? They can. Uh, we've got interested party language in all of our operating documents. Most of the cattle come from us. Uh, one of our business partners that we're partners with in our feed yard. Uh, and then my father-in-law does feed some cattle in our feed yard that go into our program as long as they meet our specifications for our meat. Mm. Uh, so, Is he on the same ranch that you guys live on? He's right next door. Next door. So the property we bought when we moved back is just on the east side of the ranch. So we extended it one section over. Mm. So when did this start to become a, a thought process and a concept for you and Kara? We started talking about it early. Like we got married in 2013. We were probably talking about it at the same time. We moved back to the family ranch the end of 2015, uh, bought our place the end of 2016. And you were in private equity. I moved to private equity in 19. 19? Yeah. And then we started the beef company in 2017. So a lot of parallel processing, running multiple streams. You know, sleep's overrated. We didn't have our first kid till 2019. That changed the game a little bit. Uh, we started the beef company in 2017. My wife was part of the Colorado Ag Leadership Program. So state-sponsored deal. Uh, she had to get sponsored by her company. Two-year leadership program. They did some international travel, did a lot of interstate travel, just trying to build agricultural leaders and one of the things she had to do was a project and we'd been talking about the beef idea for a while and it all stemmed from a conversation we had with her dad Dave it was right after we moved back we were standing in his horse barn and we were talking about the secession of the ranch where is it going to go and at that point I knew Dave pretty well and I said you know Dave I, I'm enough of a business nerd I see what you do can we do this for more generations? And he said, no. That was a gut check moment. Why, and it, Why in his head did he say no? Because the skill set he has is developed over 40 years. And you couldn't download him like the Matrix from 1999 and get half the data you wanted. It's funny, I met with a young farmer today I was telling you about earlier. Yeah. And he said, he's like, yeah, I had, I had aspirations to own a private jet. And he had seven crews running in New York City, okay. building for, you know, with him, Trump, um, some of the biggest names doing all of their HVAC. Mm -hmm. And to do it at that scale is, is large projects. Yeah. And uh, he was crushing it, making all the money you, you desired to make, or at least he had desired to make. And he became a farmer out of nowhere. I said, mm -hmm. why? He said, because I think our job as parents is to teach the next generation every single thing we know. And farming, more specifically, and ag is going away and it's mm -hmm. being taken over by China and billionaires that don't really have the same thought process as, as you and I. And they just, they just don't if you look at you know, their, their forecastings and yeah. what they're looking to do. The hard part about agriculture, if we, there's two very historic numbers to look at that are fascinating. Same time frame, 1976 to 2016. The profitability of agriculture nationwide in 76 
for every dollar you put in, you get about a dollar thirty-five back. Fair margin, right? Mm -hmm. We could probably all live on that. You can donate to who you want to. You can go help your lobbying groups. You're making enough of a wage to stay whole. In 2016, that was 14 cents. It's been cut by 60% in the last 50 years. It's not going up. Was that due to bullshit regulation? Was it due to just increasing cost of equipment? All of the above. So regulatory is a huge part. Equipment cost is a huge part. The cost of capital is massive because, you know, a truckload of cows, my father-in-law said when he started buying cattle in the mid seventies and he's fourth generation, a truckload of cattle was 50,000. A truckload of cattle today is 200 grand. And you still make around a hundred dollars an animal. So your profitability per unit hasn't changed, but your cost of inputs has quadrupled. Yeah, so you, you need a lot of capital. Yeah, so just your carry cost is killing what are the, you. What are the regulations that are hurting that industry? I know, you know, Trump, not to be political, did a lot for the farmers, right? And mm -hmm. I'd be sitting here talking out of my ass if I said I know exactly what policy moves that he made or regulatory body moves that he made that helped the farming industry, but supposedly he did. What are the ones that are big holdups for you guys in, in the beef industry? Federally, you're not going to see a lot. Even from um, a state perspective? From a state perspective, most of it is water. Some of it is county by county even. There's like counties in Oregon that you can't grow GMO crops. There's a, currently a deal on the ballot in Denver County in Colorado to not allow animal harvesting in Denver County, which is going to shut down one of the largest uh, lamb harvesting facilities in the U.S. It'll turn it off overnight. So that's the biggest regulatory issue you have. Like we own a harvest facility in our company. If they outlaw it statewide, we're off tomorrow. That's what starts to detonate stuff. What's the, what's, what's the deal with the water? Water is water rights for farming, for animal production, because you have to have a certain amount of water for cows to drink, for lambs to drink, to grow crops. And what's happening a lot of, in a lot of spaces, Idaho especially, Colorado to some degree, some people are buying property, like cities, municipalities are buying property with water rights and transferring the water rights to the water for the city. So now that, that ground that used to be incredibly profitable farm ground now has no water to grow crops mm -hmm. because they need water for the municipal water system for the town. So now that land comes so out of production. So the inner cities that have more people are pulling more of that demand, which allows them to make more money off the water than it does the farming. Yeah, and they buy the ground and dry it up. So and it's now the water shed up in New York. Yeah. You know, New York City, when you go up to the Catskills, which I'm a big fan of, I stayed there last winter. It's, you know, Wyndham, you know, Hunter, all of that area. It's called the watershed. And they take all of that and they have these massive lakes and reservoirs that pump into New York City. Mm -hmm. And they own all of it. 100%. And, and those people up there have nothing else is going to pay them that type of money. Yeah. The how, do you, water how, do you, how do you stop that, though? How, how do you, as a, as a fifth generation guy, how do you combat that? Good news is where we live, we don't really have water rights. We're out in dry land country. So you know, that's where a lot of people are like, well, you, you gotta, truck in the water. No, we just have wells for cattle. So they just have cattle. Drink, we have cattle drinking locations where cattle can go and get water. But we don't have, you know, arable water. So we don't farm. So we have grassland, miles and miles of grassland, which is dependent upon Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. Um, to some degree, that water issue is starting to raise property values. So when you talk about why is the profitability down, well, now your property values are higher. And the other economic thing I was going to mention is from 76 to 16, this was reported by Fox News, um, the, the multiple on downtown Manhattan real estate was 10x. So your $100,000 property in the 70s is worth a million now. On high production agricultural ground in that same time period, it's a 16X. So when everybody wants to get after Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and all these guys for buying farm ground, I'm not saying they're not without problem. Mathematically, we can all look at that and go, man, that makes sense. Because they're not making more farm ground. You now own the water rights. Uh, some of the biggest investments Warren Buffett's made recently is like Berkshire Hathaway bought Lemar conveyors. Um, they own a ton of different assets that are all in ag and food production. Do you think those guys have a, a, a malicious agenda buying all those farmland? I don't think so. You think it's all based just on money? I think it's 99% based on money because you got to park real estate. 
And the way the tax code works, there's actually a different schedule for agriculture. It's called the Schedule F, the farm schedule. And if you have production risk, that's the caveat. If you just own it in part or in passing and you don't have active production risk, you can't use the Schedule F. But if you're leasing that ground for a percentage of the yield, now you have production risk, you're in a different tax table mm. on that entire investment. And it's appraising or it's appreciating rapidly. And you know, if you you watch the big short, right? Mm. Movie that makes you really wonder about what's going on. You remember at the very end of the movie, the guy that predicted the the fall of the market, what's he investing in now? He's, he's shorting everything now. But he's investing in water. Yeah. The very end of the movie. They're like he's he moved all well, of his Well he actually stuff thinks water. that water is gonna be the next cause of the next world war. What's it gonna be? I mean it's water and food. Uh they're I wasn't at the presentation. My wife saw the presentation at an event. There was a gentleman that said, you know, 50 years from now, who are the three world superpowers? And we can all speculate, and I'll get to the chase really quickly, but he said it's going to be Argentina, New Zealand, and the U.S. I was like, okay, show your work. It sounds weird. And he said, with the current extrapolation of population growth, your ability to produce and export food, those are the only three countries worldwide that are going to be able to support their population and efficiently export product. And that's pretty hard math to argue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, does Argentina have problems? Sure, New Zealand's not that big. 50 years is a long time. There's port construction that can change, but Brazil, for instance, is a great example. They have two major ports that are serviced by one highway. That's not an efficient system. That's a very fragile system. Our infrastructure's kind of fragile, too. Oh, it's all fragile. Uh, do you know who Temple Grandin is? Mm -mm. She's a autistic PhD that teaches at CSU. Oh, she's probably smart as fuck. She's crazy smart. She's done a huge amount for the beef industry worldwide. And she wrote an article during COVID that basically said, COVID has proven how efficient our systems are and how fragile our systems are. And... I think it was 2022, one of the systems went down. And we put up a post on our social media and said, hey, guys, this is the third food system disruption in the last 24 months. If you don't have a week's worth of food at your house, what are you waiting for? Yeah. Not from a doomsday perspective, but, man, pay attention. Yeah, it should happen. Yeah. I mean, COVID was a big wake-up for me to be like, you know, just the most simple things is, you know, <laughs> when it came to what was going on during COVID, it was like most of shit's not manufactured here. Yeah. And what I can control, I should control, which yeah. is food, water. I just had like 35 five gallon things of water delivered over the last two weeks. Nice. Um, just because, you know, the, the reset may happen or what may happen during this election. We see all this crazy stuff online. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one thing I can control yeah. is my food and my water. Yeah. Well, and, and they can't say that in other countries, though, I think. No, it's, it's interesting to look around the world and not realize how incredibly fortunate we are but how fragile the system is as well it's all dictated by government we can get into the dollar and the monetary <laughs> system but i won't go there but right that's super interesting that's uh that's a great lesson for everybody who watches as well as myself as i listen to you talk so talk to pops yeah talk to cara colorado beef was born in 2017 yep you then go what do we do from here? How do we scale? Uh, where, was, where was your pocket at that time, right? You, you luckily, we had the dollars that you could just invest in cattle. and. Luckily, we had no kids. And we were both living pretty good in corporate America. So we had a war chest. And in 2018, we started shipping nationally. 2019 uh, was our first full year of production. We went live. Go ahead. I don't want to be too personal. But I like to give nuggets. This show is about like the young Ryan or, or Jeff starting out in the business. And you say war chess. Because mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. Like when I coach someone one-on-one -on -one and I only take on a few amount of people, especially nowadays, someone who has some type of savings put away that they can implement these, these actual items that I give them. Mm -hmm. So what does war chess mean to you to start this company? You know, give, give people a ballpark. Yeah, so the... The scary math is in 2017, we started the company. We spent 90 grand on market research websites just building out the infrastructure with zero sales. Mm -hmm. So 
that's a, a big number just to throw out there. Yeah. Um, we were also cash flowing incredibly well. So, but were you cash flowing at the time? Meaning your other companies? No, just internally, just, just the two of us with our corporate jobs. Mm-hmm. But by the time we got to the point of bringing on investors and doing what we did in 2023, we had probably personally invested million three. It's a lot of money. Yeah. But it was, you know, you got to look at the burn rate. The burn rate's most important. A war chest is great. Yeah. It's all about cash flow. Yeah. Cash flow is, cash flow is king. We all know that. Um, or you should know that. If you don't know that, look it up. <laughs> a really cool software called Currents. You should look at one day. Okay. Deal. All about cash flow on a personal, pers- you know, personal side of things. But yeah, we are actually looking at a, some Z, some ERP upgrades, going a little more digital on some of that. Yeah. Um. But it's our industry is weird because we're producing cattle and those can be financed all day. The second you convert them to steak, it's a different math. It's different math because now the bank won't secure that at the same rate it was. That's confusing to me. Uh huh. So I could finance cattle Yep. because cattle is going to produce a product of steak. No, because you can take cows to the sale barn and convert them to cash tomorrow. For what? The sale barns. Like where we live, there's sale barns every 40 miles. You're just selling cattle. Yeah. If for, the bank, for what? For, it, to do what? For, to the rest of the market. It's but an open marketplace. What? what are they doing with the cattle? It depends on where they're at in the cycle, but there's always a known monetary value. So they didn't know that a known outcome is my base is X. Yep. Yeah. And they'll loan With 80% With steak, it may be a product that sits there. Steak is a product that sits there that's not as readily movable, right? So you can come load 200 head of cattle worth half a million bucks. They'll go on seven semis, take you an hour and a half to load them. You have a check that night. If I have those same 200 cows on pallets in a freezer, there's there's a massive discount to try to move that and the bank doesn't want to deal with it. So yeah, when you're dealing with money with, now. Yeah, when you're dealing with agricultural banks, they have very known commodity sets. So we start to move What are the top agricultural banks? Oh, uh HTLF's a big one. Ag Credit is a big one, the Ag Credit system. Uh Busey Bank is big. They're like a thirty million or thirty billion dollar bank. Um the big banks don't plan it much? A lot of them, have, they will play in the real estate side, but on the operating side, they don't play a lot. Because they don't understand it, or it's just not their niche? They've started moving away from it because regulatorily it gets really dicey, mm-hmm. and it takes a lot more management. You have to be a lot tighter to the business. Um, so there's very specialized ag banks just for agriculture, but when you start doing something a little different, then the ag banks are like, oh, man, that's that's not the cut and dried stuff we used to do yesterday. So you start growing your company and then you have to really make that leap from regional bank to national bank, which is not a small jump. And that's the state we're currently in as we're moving into the bigger banks. And that's where outside investment helps as well. 100%. Uh, so yeah, uh, 19 we started shipping nationally, or 18 we started shipping nationally, 19 we launched website purchasing and we had, we were incredibly fortunate with the timing. When COVID popped off, we were set up. Everything was debugged, and the year of COVID, we tripled, we tripled in sales, and we were back ordered for nine of twelve months. So, for the viewer watching, you know, what is your target market? Who are you selling to? <laughs> That's an interesting question. We originally thought it was going to be soccer moms, right? It was going to be moms in minivans who want their kids to eat clean. Turns out. Our target market is me and you. Men 35 to 55 that like guns and like to cook meat with fire. Uh, I don't know a better way to say that, but that is really the way it's went. Uh, We had some assumptions. We had focus groups (laughs) that proved to be good learning lessons. But our target market has turned into that 35 to 55 male. How much Uh, did you pay for those focus groups to give you data? I think it was like 15 grand not bad no and it helped us with some of our product staging of what do people want to buy uh because really common in our space everybody wants to buy a half a beef that's what a lot of the ranchers sell they sell a half a beef because it's easy 
oh, you pay this much. We tell it on the per pound basis. It's very And are you selling simple. half a beef to a restaurant? Or are you selling that to the individual buyers? Most ranchers are selling it to individuals. Uh, very seldom do you find direct to consumer that's going at scale to restaurants because it's very hard to meet the demand of a good restaurant, um, especially at scale. And most of the restaurants want 200 pounds of ribeyes a week, which is about seven head worth of ribeyes. And then you have all the rest of the cow to sell. Uh, so you have to structure it appropriately. And that's really what the focus groups helped us with is which way are we going to drive stuff? You know, we got to move a little burger. We got to move roasts. And I know I'm diving deeper into this yeah. this side of it, but so let's just say you're, uh, you know, growing up, my parents were poor, um, worked very hard. I had a roof over my head, clothes on my back, but they, you know, they bought like the occasional steak and it was like a London broil. Okay. Uh, or something that was cheap at ShopRite or A&P or Food Town. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, that's what I, I was brought up around. I never knew of a family who bought a, a quarter cow, half a cow, or full cow, like a lot of my friends do in our ecosystem nowadays. What would you say to the family out there that doesn't buy a, a half a cow? Um, how would you educate them to go and buy, whether it be your company or any of the others out there, which we'll dive into what makes you different versus them? Mm -hmm. What would you tell them? I would say really look at the math because while we can assume beef is expensive, and I would agree on a per pound basis, it is more expensive. It's also the most bioavailable protein for humans. It has a lot more vitamins and nutrients in it. It will keep you satiated longer, so you need to eat less of it. It stores better, and you typically have to put less crap on it. You know how many people love chicken wings? I'm guilty of that. But you don't eat chicken wings for the chicken wings, you eat them for the sauce, mm -hmm. which is full of sugar and all the other crap. So if you are really looking at food as an investment and fuel, Beef is the cleanest alternative because if you get good beef, people want to eat it. But it might give us high blood pressure and high cholesterol and kill us. You should read the carnivore diet. That'll <laughs> fix that. Dr. Sean Baker is one of our teammates. I've read it. And the guy is an absolute stud. Uh, I'm personally down 70 pounds on the carnivore diet. Damn, you're down 70 pounds? Yeah. Let yeah, that it. was a, holding my little girl in the hospital the first day. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I got a bad trend line. I'm going to fix that. And thus, jujitsu and carnivore diet and... No shit. Yeah. yeah. Do you still eat carnivore? Mostly. Unless I go out with fun people and then we're eating polenta and yeah. all the other stuff. You ate polenta. I had steak. Yeah, you did. But you had <laughs> potatoes. I had polenta. I did. I had a couple potatoes. <laughs> Just a couple. Um, it's still carnivore, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so it's it's about an investment and a mindset about where you're spending your money. I think it's also how we set up at home yes. nowadays. I think it's different. Like I have you know, a deep freezer. Mm -hmm. I have five refrigerators in my house mm -hmm. and I have a unique setup but you know I have a freezer in each one of those refrigerators so I could you know set up beef and yeah. let it sit there and that was a change of lifestyle for me versus going down to the butcher and spending 29 bucks on, a, on an average Angus ribeye um, you know I now have stuff stocked in the freezer yeah. that I have to like think about that a, a day ahead of time throw it in the refrigerator or leave it out on the counter early that morning. Yep. Um, it's just a different way of life. But how long can the, the, the shelf life of beef be in the freezer? So the USDA standard is a year in the freezer. Uh, Multivac, which is who provides us with our packaging bags for the vacuum seal, says that as long as the seal is still good, it'll go for two. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Um, I always heard a year. Yeah, I mean, a year is kind of the typical answer. I don't know. Steak never lives at our house that long. Probably not here either. No, definitely not. No, but... You see Big Matty? Yeah, I feed him every day for <laughs> right. lunch. Yeah. Dude crushes some steak, I'm sure. Yeah. Doesn't eat a lot of hamburger, though. He's probably an expensive date. He is very expensive, but he's <laughs> worth it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you can buy in bulk, like, and ask your local producer. I'm not saying just shop with me. Yeah. You know, you've got local guys here, I'm sure. Jersey has a lot of agriculture. They do. I personally don't want to ship to New Jersey every day. New Jersey is expensive. Once I get past Ohio, my cost of, my cost of shipping is incredible. Mm -hmm. I'll serve anybody. But find a local producer, get informed, and build a relationship. Because if, if your best option is, hey, i got to buy a burger, that's what I can afford, I would bet you a lot of your local guys have extra burger. Mm -hmm. They have extra roasts. If you tell them, hey, I really want to buy from you, what can you do to help me? They want to help you too. That's what they want to do. So, you know, the one thing we never do 
is we never demonize the rest of the food system. You know, local butchers are awesome. The big four, I have an ax to grind with them to some degree, but they control 85% of the market. If we turn them off tomorrow, we all have a problem. Yeah. That's just not a smart You move. ought to have the abundance mindset together to fight that 85%. 100%. So my competitor is not Little Belt Cattle Company out of Montana. Greg Putnam's a retired SEAL. He's a solid dude. On paper, he's my competitor. Or J.P. Dinell that works for Jocko. He has a company with his friend Steve Little down in Texas. They make great beef. I'm on your podcast giving out other company names. Like, mm -hmm. I love those guys. They're good producers. They're good ranchers. They're good humans. Well, because if one by one starts to go out, you're all out. Yeah. Like, you're... We have some great butchers here. You know, Colonial Market, you know, great friends of mm -hmm. ours. They're in Point Pleasant. Um, Dutch Hill, uh, he actually had a farm at one point, went to the farmer market, came in and, and, and started doing it as a localized butcher. Yeah. There's a ton here in New Jersey. Um, what I wish those guys were willing to do more, which you are, is get on this podcast yeah. or another podcast or market themselves on social media because you can't be stuck on beepers when cell phones have been out for 10 years. Yeah. And uh, here in New Jersey, there is a lot of those guys that per can provide that to the families that we're, we're talking about. And uh, I have a large platform here that can help them promote their business. And I wish they would flip their mind from that old school farming mm -hmm. thought process to, you know, welcome to, you know, 2024. Yeah. Like one of our best wholesale buyers is Wasi's Meat Market in Melbourne, Florida. Oh, well, my buddy lives there. They sell dry aged beef that they produce elsewhere. They sell custom cut beef there, but they love our bacon and our beef sticks. And you'll provide that stuff here to Jersey to these butchers. And 100%. Yeah. And and I know that they are on paper our competitors, but Frank Wassey in Melbourne is a solid dude. I had dinner with him over the 4th. Like, great, great guy. And he's like, hey, man, we kind of compete. I don't want to get into that, but I love to support this. What's wrong with that? So Chris Egger that's sitting here, he, he's a, a Merrill Lynch advisor, and uh, we're not allowed to you know, commingle any type of you know, investments. It's illegal, mm -hmm. according to Finner and the SEC. Um, and Chris wouldn't want to risk his business. I don't want to risk mine. Sure. But there's different ways that you know, Chris may have a conversation with somebody that approaches him that's a non-client, and they may say, hey, I need, I need this thing. And Chris is like, hey, that's not my expertise. Go speak to Ryan and, and vice versa. Yeah. And I think that if more p people collectively as small business owners, because Dutch Hill is a small business owner, mm -hmm. his farm that he's buying from New Jersey is a small business owner, Colorado Craft Beef is a small business owner out in the West Coast. Yeah. If we can all kind of create this chain of communication and think as, as an entity moving forward, instead we all kind of lock in, we get like, this is mine. And, and I'm not just talking your industry, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all small business and work together kind of collectively with more people in your world, you end up kind of finding different ways that you can make money together and play off each other's strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, what's that, that term they use in private equity? What are our aligned incentives? I want people buying local. I want people propping up their local producers the best they can so they can make more money. But I also realize that if a single mom needs to buy at Walmart because that's what she can afford, that's what she needs to do, and I support that too. Yeah, same. Do what's good for you. You'll never hear a word from us. We support that, and if there's anything we can do to help, let me know. Yeah. Like, that famine mindset is crushing the agricultural industry because agriculture as a whole is... I'm going to pull you into this real quick because you oh, said geez. it at dinner. All right. So you say you get a lot of hate. Yeah. You know, from from mainly people in, in your space. Yeah. What would you say to those people that may be hating on your social and how you're going about doing things that is different from the typical you know, beef company? So I think a lot of the hate we catch is from people that don't understand what we're doing. You also have eyes. So when you have eyes, you have, you have more hate. 100%. It's, it happens. And I get it. But I think people are jumping to conclusions, getting defensive without understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, because frankly, some of the stuff we've been accused of by some of the people that hate us on social, I'd be pissed about if I was doing too, but what I'm not. What were you accused of? I don't want to get into all the details. Maybe something to, like, high level, something. Um, one guy said that we had a commercial feed yard, so we're not actually direct to consumer. I don't He's, know what that means, but it sounds like, I it, guess it could be against what you sell. Uh, I don't know. He, 
He's thinking we're massive commercial producers. We, the other one we get a lot of hate of, this is a great example. This kind of circulates a lot. Because my wife is fifth generation, everybody thinks we were handed everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, if somebody gave me those opportunities, I'm like, I'm almost certain nobody well, gave me I, anything. <laughs> I'm going to stand up for you because I don't know who said that or who, you know, no beef with any of those people. But, like, that's some, that's some fucking victim shit. Because mm-hmm. no matter what somebody else was handed has no relation to your pocket. Stop counting other people's money. Yeah. Stop trying to figure out how they got it. How about you learn from what they're doing and take all of that and put it into action steps in your world? Yeah. And especially if they're doing something that you want to do, beef, finance, selling cars, whatever it may be, go learn from that person and yeah. go put it into motion in your world. Yeah, because we spend a ton of time, my wife and I personally, spend a lot of our time helping other producers. I mean, when I heard J.P. Donnell was starting a beef company, I texted him. I was like, hey, bro, if you guys need any help, shipping, UPS contacts, let me know. I got you. should be. Like, and people are like, man, that's, but he's your competitor. I'm like, hey, Texas is our number four market. I'm still not worried about it. You know how many people are in Dallas? (laughs) What do you think got into the mindset of the Americans? Uh, And not just from your, your, Mm -hmm. your industry, you know, all of business, where it was everything like, yeah, this is mine. Yeah. Like, stay Dude, out. Like, I, what happened? I have thought about this a lot. And if we think not just ag, but I think this is a great example. I just mentioned, you know, profitability went from 35 to 14. Right. Well, that's happening in every industry. Mm-hmm. Everybody's watching this declining curve. Or if you think about what money is worth or, you know, the Don Drapers of the world, right? Mad Men. How much did they make in the 50s compared to what the dollar is worth today? Everybody's seeing this declining curve, and it's building a famine mindset in society. Yeah, we need to flip that, though, and that's how we explode. Yeah, I was on uh, Greg Anderson's podcast last month, and I said, you know, the weird thing is when everybody came back from World War II, you should start your own company. You should build all this stuff. You need to have this entrepreneurial mindset. And at some point, that switched to corporate jobs. And corporate jobs was the jam. And that's when you came out with pensions and the financial benefit of those types of jobs. And somewhere in the last 20 or 30 years, that switched to government jobs. And you should have have a government job, and that's how you can't get fired. I'm like, that is a declining curve. So everybody's seeing that, and that famine mindset's just being boiled on everybody. That's my humble opinion. Yeah, and that's 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 the wrong opinion. You have 12 million government employees... Now, I'm not saying the government doesn't do some great things, but they fuck up a lot of things, too. Yeah. And uh, they definitely fuck up creativity, um, large aspirations, being able to go, you know, obtain financial freedom. Mm-hmm. And that's what Fireside's all about helping people get to. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's easy when you do it with others like you and me and the people in our ecosystem that say, how do we work together to help one another versus smash one another? And you have to do that kind of stuff with the right mindset because if you're worried about taking it's a long a pie, time. yeah, if you're worried about taking a pie that's six inches across and divvying it, up, divvying it up among 20 people, nobody's going to have enough. But if you say, hey, guys, I need you to buy a third of this pie and we're going to make that some bitch 18 inches across, everybody wins. Mm-hmm. It's not about who gets how much of the pie, it's how big do we make the pie. Correct. And that is something ag especially loses because they're so worried they're going to get squeezed. How do they correct it? Hell if I know. Because everybody's worried about what the next guy makes on the deal. Big leader speaking up, someone bringing light to it. It's, in my humble opinion, in agriculture, the thing we're running into. Like a great example is our company. I mean, I told you we probably spent a million to a million three by the time we, you know, took an investment round. Imagine if I could only do that with my father-in-law's money, right? The, the generational money that we didn't have access to. And I said, hey, we want to do this. We need 200K. Hey, we need 200 again. Now we need 150. We need, at what point are you going to tell us no? When so, it's broke? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Because you're doing something they're not used to. Um, he is 67. Yeah, they thought live small. Make yeah, he's make. 68 this year. He'll be, he'll be 68 this month. And the guy's doing great. He's killing it. But asking him to go out on a limb financially. To bet on the way you have to bet and spend money. 
Yeah. You had to spend that much more of a of a of a capital infusion to make the same rates of return you did 30 years ago, and it's yeah. it's. Yeah, well, I don't. I don't know if it's five to one. I don't. I don't know what the exact ratio is in your world, but it's yeah, much and he's, larger. And he's also still running the commercial ranch. Like that's the deal. Like, are, are you going to ask the older generations who don't really have a retirement, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're still working. Cash poor, land rich. A yeah, lot of times in that space. and so how do you convert that secession plan? while operating so they can still live how they want but you get the ranch ready it's called the permission slip it's large life insurance that's tax-free but that's for another day yeah well and with the understanding that those guys for 50 years have watched the profitability get cut by 60 percent they don't have a growth mindset they have a sustainable uh, uh, a hope to sustain mindset they're an extraction Uh, let me let me let me take less off the table less off the table less off the table and they're in a deductive mindset and if they've done it that long do you think you're going to get them to move off the farm or relinquish control no probably not definitely not so when you say how do you change the the problem of those guys that are 67 and 68 and that's no shot at Kara's father no it's if they if they put the right succession plans in place that's how you take back america and it's a, Mm -hmm. a massive infusion of capital with leverage and uh that's done with pennies on the dollar through smart planning Especially yeah. in the farm world, when you guys have no cash, it's all based on you know hopefully you know collateralizing the land and doing that. Yeah, farm. and then the bank will be happy to take it. Yeah, the and bank can take it all they want when you have the right <laughs> when you have the right levers to pull on. They bank come take it. I have this infusion of capital that comes in when I die, mm-hmm. and that's you know that's the stuff that that we do. Yeah, you know, I was talking to some farming uh, lenders, right, Trevor? They're farming lenders in uh, Charlotte last week. And they were running through these numbers, and they, uh, I, I, you know, it's, I, I do finance for a living, and I was arguing with these guys twelve different ways sideways. I had some drinks in me, and I just kept running circles <laughs> around them. And I'm like, you guys, you, you, you can't give me a good rate of return based on what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You need to build the plan out differently. Yeah. And I did by the end of the conversation, which was like an hour and a half long, you know, get them to think differently about money. And I think that generation of like, especially farmers and all small business owners. Mm-hmm. If you're 67 years old, you need to find a way to properly succeed that business to the next generation. But do you have a business? Because in agriculture, like uh, farmers and everybody else, you don't have a business. You raise commodities. If you, you have, have someone like you and Kara in place, I have a business. Potentially. I want to I I pass that down if everybody's on the same page. Yep. Um, but in some aspects, all you have is cows. You have to have a marketing plan, which if you're in the commodity space, could go upside down tomorrow. Mm. There's a ton of other externalities that just get nasty. Yeah. And when you start thinking about how all that works, I mean, a great example is when Kara and I moved back, we looked at a place and the real estate was like, apologies for everybody that lives in an expensive part of the country because we don't. It was 4,000 acres, three houses. One of the houses was like 11,000 square feet with a pool. And it was on the market for like 4.2 million. And when you did the math on what it would cost to pay the debt, operate the place, and buy the cows that the place would sustain, it was a $400,000 cash loser every every year, out of the gate. And that's where the young people that wanna get involved are just getting crushed. Because if you don't have the collateral, you don't have the leverage, you can't build. But that's why it's so much important for the people who own it currently to pass it to the next generation. Or a successor. You could make a couple billion dollars if you figured out how to tell those guys to do that. Put me in front of them. I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> there you go. Hey, we got a guy from Jersey that's going to come to western Utah. Yeah, and punch you in the face. <laughs> yeah. With my words. Not, there you go. Not literally. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it, listen, most businesses, you know, tough to get up and running. And, yeah. you know, that is, you know, that much more difficult. Mm-hmm. I want you to tell me quickly about your private equity career and then how you guys went into we're talking about you know capital being tight and what it costs to get this thing up and running and then scale it it's even you know that much more capital you need to put in you were in private equity which is also attached to ag Mm -hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about that job and those people you met yeah the private equity piece was pretty uneventful i was in private equity for about four years Uh, they were very very smart people they're actually on our board now they we were able to keep all the relationships put together when I left them and then they helped us do what we did with the beef company. But generally speaking, I was the boots on the ground guy. Like we had analysts that were crazy good at Excel and we had insane business people that were MIT MBA holders and Harvard law grads. 
And I was the guy that kind of worked between the two of them to say, yes, this works or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, no huge deals in the time. Uh, COVID hit right in the middle of it, kind of put a, a cap on everything. So uneventful from a talking standpoint, but incredibly impactful for me from a learning standpoint, because it's like going in the kitchen and watch how the chefs work. Yeah, I'm going to fast forward that. You end up saying, hey, I, I need you know, to take on some investors. Um, could you guys help me with this? And because you had that relationship and all those things that you did learn from these you know, men and women, you're able to create some type of partnership. Obviously, they're on your board. Did they start to kind of help you build out the cap table and what you needed to do to build the pitch deck? How did that look for you? Were you familiar with that because you were in private equity already? And how did you guys go about that whole process? Yeah, it's just like you just described. I mean, they they helped with the cap table, they helped with the build out, the valuation, the pitch deck. Uh, the model was the big one. Um, obviously building a private equity level model is a nightmare, but it also gave us a level of credibility that you know, we aren't just ranchers that can kind of run Excel. I mean, when you can pull out a PE level pitch deck with a PE level cap table and a PE level financial deck and run it through with IRRs at the back and you're showing people in real business what they are used to seeing. Because they have other sides that are testing. They have formulas to test your, your Excel sheet. And, and more so than that, you're coming to them in a language they want to be talked to. That's, That's the biggest freaking step is you don't go to them saying, I want you to be a part of what I do. You go to them saying, I want to be a part of what you do, but I need you to help me. Can someone give me a mini bourbon? Maddie? Can't see over there. Maddie sleeping. I can give you this if you want, Maddie. Oh. But, sure. He's getting bourbon and water. Thank you, sir. So what was, I mean, in sales, what's your job? You for can, me, is to get over the objectives mm -hmm. and come up with a solution for your problem. Add value, right? Yeah. You're supposed to add value. So we needed value added, but we have to let people do that in the way they want. No different than how we sell beef. We need to sell beef to people in the way they want to buy it, not how we want to sell it. And meet them at their... Yeah, meet them at their buying decision, right? Yeah. And in private equity, you kind of have to do the same thing. Who are you going to go talk to? Who's your target audience? I mean, I've pitched some deals 15 times and have 13 copies of a deck because, oh, these people, this equity group focuses in this vertical. This equity group focuses on this mission. It could be a language change. It could be a presentation change. But the thought that a deck works for all potential investors is yeah. insanity it doesn't i mean what was your first initial thought process on uh, on capital raise what, what was the the number we didn't really have a number in mind our first process was we're expanding so rapidly the bottleneck in our business cash flow no harvest space really yeah I you guys have a lot of acreage out there though but harvest space for cows converting cows to steak that's Got where it, it becomes money right got it and in the regional packaging world, the re regional harvest facility world, there's not a lot of assets. And the facility we were using that we had used since we started the company, we were approximately 30% of their business. And we were growing like crazy. And through COVID, we were having to speak for harvest slots two years out, which is before the cows that are being harvested are born. Mm -hmm. So what happened was over time, we were projecting well, but then we would have to slow down marketing because we were selling too quickly. So it was this constant battle between- Operation sales. 100%. And you couldn't, when you found the gold vein, you couldn't pump marketing because you didn't have enough product. So basically the entirety of 2022, we had marketing turned off for six months. And then in September, we turned it back on. Which is on. like this awesome problem to have, but it's also not good as you're trying to scale. 100%. And we said, man, we how do you get past that? Like, we're finding the right spots. Just buying more cows? Uh, no, it was more harvest space, but you couldn't get more dates because the dates are taken by other ranchers because these are custom facilities. Mm. And you can't go put cattle on feed if you don't have a spot for them to go because when they're finished, meaning they've gained the weight they're going to yeah, gain, they're done. they need to be done, you can't just keep feeding them. You start losing money. 
So it's like, my goodness, which way do you go? And we said, we need to own the facility so that we have the ability to kind of control the throttle, if you will, albeit it needs to be financially functional, but it also needs to be, you know, viable as a business long term because it's already an operating business. Luckily, the Harvest facility is a regional asset, keeps a lot of people in our region, you know, finding ways to move cattle. It, it's not something we want to take offline. Are you, are you, and you might have just said this, but Matt distracted me with this massive bourbon. I said a little one. <laughs> Got to make sure I don't drink this thing for the end of the podcast. Right. We'll don't fall track. in the fire. <laughs> we'll, we'll, no, we'll just get off track real quick. Okay. And we're having a great discussion. So when you bought this facility, did you bring on other ranchers utilizing your facility to bring on additional revs, or you were just focused on They were already there. So So you just took on we, merger, essentially. Yep. And then, and then slowly people have left the market. Cattle are crazy high right now, just on live cattle. So people aren't harvesting as many. So it's opened up facilities for us to expand and not push people out. Um, but, you know, testament to what we were talking about earlier, our three biggest competitors in our region kill at our facility. They harvest cattle with us. Mm -hmm. The first thing we did is we called them the day after we bought it and said, hey, this is what's going on. We want you to hear it from us. We want to sit down and talk. Your schedule's We're solid. We're doing the same thing as you. And we sat down and said, what do you need from the plant to grow your business? And they all looked at us like we had three foreheads. Yeah, no one's ever asked them that. No, I said, what do you need? What do you want to grow to? If we're going to deploy capital, is there something you need? And they looked at us like we were crazy. But that's our goal. Like, helping our business is important. But it's not just about us. It's about the industry. Mm -hmm. And since then, you know, we've got some capital or we've got some new equipment coming. We've got new packaging options. That's servant leadership. And that's, that's how you get to the next level. I, I sure hope so. In any aspect. No, I, I think it is. And so go. to your question about how much cash did you want to raise? It what that was, facility cost? The first question was, we need new working capital because we're going to tool up. We're going to expand inventory. We need to buy this facility and we need a runway to do it. And that was where the math came from. And that's when you brought on investors from the PE and some of their relationships? Uh, that's when we started searching for capital. We started in the PE realm. We talked to some folks. Um, Did you get anything from PE? No. No, we were we were headed down that path when we thought more strategically about what we were doing. And capital, while important, is not as important as mission-driven partners. Yeah, you need you need someone on the same page. And and mission-driven partners that can add value. And Would you say that private equity a lot of time? Uh, they are smart in what they do. Obviously, that's why they keep buying up most of America. Um, they're not really on the same mission as us, and uh, they take over control quickly. Yeah, in a typical private equity evolution, I mean, two years is common. Four years is still okay. Six to eight years is an eternity in private equity. Mm -hmm. They want to come in. They want to tool up. They want to show lever, a spike in rev and then, lever and then move it. I mean, they want to catch that big rise and move on. They are not in the business of legacy investments, typically. Um, the folks we were talking to a couple different times were on that train. They understood it was more of a legacy thing, but we also understood that when it came to growing direct to consumer, when it came to Amazon, all the other things we knew we had to do, they weren't going to add a lot of value. So they're going to pay. You sell beef on Amazon? We do now. Yeah, we launched on Amazon a few weeks ago, a couple yeah. months ago. Sorry. Okay. So we sell tallow, summer sausage, beef sticks, and we do have one steak box up there. Yeah, your, your beef sticks were delicious. Thank you. I need to try some of the tallow for my Blackstone. I got you. But so it was like, man, if we're going to get X valuation from some guys that are really just going to say, where's our disbursement? Or the same basic valuation from people that could add value and help coach us, what's the smarter play? Mm-hmm. Or even if we give up 10 or 20% more to the guys that add all this other value, what do we do? I mean, that, that seems like a no brainer. Uh, so in early 22, we got a hold of Pete Roberts, who is the founder and CEO of Origin. Actually, the jacket and the jeans I'm wearing right now are covered in ash, thanks to Maddie and his poor wood choices. <laughs> um, and that road. Pete's guy on the East Coast. Yeah, main, main. guy. Yeah main guy that is just crushing it 
and uh, ended up talking to Brian. Pete, make sure you get on Fireside, buddy. Uh, I got you. <laughs> uh, we started just kind of working through different stuff, and it all came about, I actually listened to Jocko and Pete's first podcast. And I listened to Pete talk about the, the genesis of Origin as a company. And he was told, you're too small. You can't compete. You'll never be profitable. You're going to have to charge too much. All the same stuff. Sounds like it comes from private equity. Yeah, it's all the same stuff we've been getting beaten with. And I was like, well, he's doing it. They're successful. And, and this is something I, I, I got to jump in and leave mm-hmm. a nugget for the viewers. Like, if you have a vision, go for it. Fuck what anybody else says. Yeah. Go for it. And don't ever come off that throttle. You're going to be put against the, the wall. You're going to be put into these corners. You're going to have anxiety. You're going to have major stress. But you always find a way to win if you're fixated on that vision. Mm-hmm. And that's something obviously Pete is doing, you and your wife are doing, and many other business owners who have become extremely successful. And I'm not saying these guys end up billionaires, some will, but they end up living a really, really successful life and doing what they desire to do with their family and their loved ones. Yeah. And, you know, it took about 14 months by the time we did the whole deal. And by the time we ended the round and did all the mountains of paperwork and tens of thousands of dollars in legal and all the other non-sexy stuff about a deal we ended up with pete and brian as partners and who's brian brian is the chief product officer of jocko fuel and the one of the co-founders of jocko fuel actually and what else did brian do brian is i believe the fourth employee at origin he'd been with origin for quite a while uh of course with those guys uh they brought jocko so jocko willink is one of our partners uh, they brought some other people uh, from the private and equity world. If you guys world. don't know Jocko, just get on the internet and yeah, it's J O C K O. There's uh, our attorneys or our accountants spelled it Jacko J O C K O. I was like, guys, please switch that. If he sees that on reporting documents, I'm going to be very embarrassed. The best thing that I, I I like about Jocko is that that good video. Oh yeah, I played it for our team last week. And that is so powerful. Yeah, like you suck, good room to get better. Yeah, you get that job, good. Work yep. harder, like it's it, that's 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 entrepreneurship. That's life. You know, the biggest value those guys provided is a mindset shift for me. We had some stuff going on last week. Called them and said, "Guys, we got to get on the phone." Walked them through it. Pete goes, "Hey, brother. No problem. Keep crushing it. You good?" And he was out. Something I thought was incredibly, incredibly negative. He's like, "Yeah, bro. Basically." I joked about it with my wife. I said, I think he just said, like, welcome to the show. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, like uh, it man, this, what this, happens. this meeting could have been an email. This isn't even a Tuesday. Like, and I mean that with all the respect in the world because I looked at that and I was like, I'm thinking about this wrong. And, and for You're 70. You're to have those problems. Yeah. And for 72 hours, I am, like, burning spreadsheets. I'm just in the mud. And I get on that phone call with him and I'm like. Because I think in my brain, I'm failing these guys. I got to do better. I got to this. And they're like, yeah, man. Good job. That means you're doing well. Keep going. I was like, oh, my bad. And sometimes you just need that little conversation. Yeah. It's just like, okay. Well, it, it was great. The look on Pete's face was like, why, why are we talking about this? And it's, it's that same reason that I was like, man, these guys could be very impactful for me because they're so much further down the road. Mm-hmm. And what he brings up, I'm just like. Wow. Okay. They're like, yeah, yeah, that checks out. That that this would be the right time for that problem. Moving on. And are they are, are they a, a minority partner in the business? Or? Uh, they're they're material partners for sure. Um, Kara and I are still the primary. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Pete. How many but, other investors do you guys have? And in- uh, we've got quite a few for such a small company, but they're they're very strategically picked. Got it. So Leif Babin is on our team. Uh, Travis Mills is on our team. Dave Burke is on our team. Who's Dave Burke? Uh, he was the forward air controller that was with Jocko and Ramadi. Uh, he's a fighter pilot, so a former Top Gun instructor. Solid, solid dude. It's like a consulting business, right? Uh, Echelon Front. Echelon Front is their company. Um, leadership, I mean, to anybody that wants to level up, read Extreme Ownership, read Dichotomy of Leadership, I promise I don't get any money from that. It's helped me immensely. Yeah, it's a great book. Uh, it makes you really quickly look at yourself, Jocko's book, of like, it's all my fault. 
And that's okay, right? Yeah. Like one of the biggest employee failures I've had recently, I had to look in the mirror and talk to our team about it and say, guys, I screwed this up. I've I yelled at Maddie up. and been like, that's, I'm yelling at Maddie. I, I trained Matt, my fault. Yeah. <laughs> or I didn't train Matt, my yeah. fault. And it, but it gives you such a different perspective. And then like, you know, Dylan's here in the background and I showed him a video. We dropped a video on Instagram today with Travis Mills. For and those of you, Travis, exactly. I know he's an investor, but was uh, Travis is one of I think four or five quadruple amputees to have survived the war on terror. Oh fuck! He set his backpack on an IED in Afghanistan. He lost both legs above the knee. He lost his right arm. His left arm, I believe, is below the elbow. And he's our investor. And he dropped a video. We dropped a video with him today. I look around, you know, I watch the guy speak and I'm in tears because I'm like, my problems don't matter. Yeah, I'm such a sissy. Yeah. It actually quickly shows you it's all in here. A hundred percent. Yeah. And we went and watched him speak and his father-in-law travels with him. And Craig comes up to me and goes, hey, go stand behind Travis when he comes off stage. He's doing a meet and greet. I was like, uh, what's the mission, man? What do you need from me? He goes, if he falls down, help him up. Make sure nobody's an asshole. I was like, check. Yeah. And he goes, never happens. Just, I like yeah, to have somebody with him. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy is so much tougher than me. And he believes in me. Like, that's some heavy shit to carry around. Yeah. But it's so incredibly powerful to extend yourself. Makes you feel small, but also so. Yeah, but what's that other saying? If you're, if you're not scared, you're not shooting high enough. Yeah. Like, Figure it out. Go chase some dragons, man. I keep shooting way too high. I think I need to settle down at some point. Disagree, dude. This is legit. You should have three more of these. Yeah, you don't even know how expensive boulders are. <laughs> I found that out real quick. I thought you could just pull them off the side of a mountain, but... Well, you can't. You just can't let them catch you, and you need $180,000 worth of machines Yeah, to I just do need, it. like, a lot more, like, you know, 18-wheelers. And I mean, Maddie works out. He could have done one a month or something, right? Dude, these little boulders over here, like, or the large ones on the yeah. back end, they're 3,000 pounds. Yeah. Per. So you got to get a running start, Matty. <laughs> we need to get that big excavator with the gripper hand. That's right, start with the moving. thumb. Yeah, the thumb start moving these things around. But Yeah, go big or go home. Yeah, and, man, if if you're not doing something that scares you a little bit, that's fine. But don't be afraid of the guy, or don't be hating on the guy that's actually trying to do that. Yeah, man in the arena. Yeah, 100%. Well, you guys, you and Kara, um, all your investors, you know, team like Jocko and Pete, uh, I, I can't say I fully look up to those guys because I don't know them mm -hmm. personally, but I see their brands online are huge. And to be aligned with that is already a leg up for you, your understanding of the agriculture world, your wife being fifth generation, and uh, your background in, in PE and understanding you know, how the spreadsheets look and work. Um, I think you guys have a big future ahead. Yeah. Uh, you're of the abundance mindset. Most people should take note of that. We all need to be of the abundance mindset. And we're when we're competitive motherfuckers, especially here in the Northeast, like it sucks because a lot of times I see these guys out west in Utah or out where you are, they work together. They all may hate each other behind mm -hmm. the scenes, but they do work together. And uh, that's something all of us need to do more in all of our industries. Like it's not all about just you. Yeah, and you know, not to... Not to beat the Jocko and Echelon front drum too heavy. The coolest thing about the whole deal. Because I followed all those guys for quite a while. Didn't know them. Went in cold. They have proven time and time again they are who they so, yeah. show themselves to be. Behind the camera. Outside of the view of everybody. They live that life. And I've seen people that don't. Mm -hmm. And to watch There's those people talk about that stuff, share that stuff and live that stuff is incredibly, incredibly intimidating, but it keeps me operating at the highest level all the yeah. time. You're and the average of the five people you put around you, man. Yeah, and go find those people. Yeah, go find them. Like, Pay to get in the room, you know, work your way in the room, add value to get in the room, whatever it takes, get in the room. Yeah. You know, whatever that room is, you know, or just being able to have access to those people. So rounding out that this podcast, I'd like to ask two questions. You know, we talked a lot about Jocko, the Esco on front, some of these other people that are you know, power players in your and Kara's business. Um, who are some other people you want to give some love to that has inspired you, that has been a mentor to you, who is, you know, helpful to, you know, Colorado craft beef? Man, there's such a list of people. You know, I mentioned Bob early on, Bob Barton out of Hermiston, Oregon. Nobody's probably ever heard of that place. 
that guy has a special spot in my heart for what he's done for me and the human he made me. And I can't thank that guy enough. And I've told him that in person, and I'll probably tell him again. Send him this podcast. I hope Bob watches it. Oh, I'm sure he will. I mean, he hit a Harley wreck like last year, so he's he's still kind of fucked up. <laughs> be like, hey, Bob, how you doing? He's like, five pounds left hand. I was like, man, that was a while ago. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I was fixing fence and broke the plate Ooh. in his arm. I was like, maybe you should have given up before the steel did. He's like, but, you know, my wife has been incredible. I mean, I have pushed her limits with this company. I'm the more risky, let it ride, push it down the mountain, we'll figure it out. And watching her grow has been incredible because, you know, we talked at dinner. I've, I'm very much a generalist. I'm two inches deep and three miles wide. I can kind of do what I need to do. She's been very siloed in the cattle industry. Yeah, she's fixated. And incredibly good at what she does, but to watch her expand and be like what do you need from me like it empowers you more it does and it's incredible to watch someone believe in you like that yeah and that is not lost on me yeah belief is like the biggest thing yeah the people that you love believe in you it's life-changing yeah and and just our whole team man like our feed yard manager tell oh we had a fire last week you saw it on instagram he calls me. I always answer his phone calls. Got some bitch never calls me to tell me stuff's going well. <laughs> but he's also the guy that I just know stuff rock solid. Mm-hmm. And Mike is that way. And our whole team at the Harvest Facility. And, you know, that is the thing that really sets us apart as a company is we have the ranch, the feed yard, the Harvest Facility. We have control of all of it. But at the same time, we have control of all of it. That's also not undaunting in and of itself. Second so, question. Yeah. And I'm going to change this up versus how I usually do it. You see a lot of things going on talking about the, the health of food and mm-hmm. the poisoning of our population. You see RFK running on this, you know, thought process of, like, we need to make America healthier again. And we talked about a couple different companies, and we don't have to, you know, get sued and talk about any one Specifically, but you have a lot of these companies that send out similar boxes to yours that you guys were, were gracious enough to send to me and Maddie. You know, talk about the main difference between what they're doing. Is that all being done in one big place and they're all getting the meat from that place and shipping it out and saying it's one thing? And I don't know the rules and regulation of how they're allowed to market, but it does sound like what you and Kara and Colorado Craft Beef has going on is much different than that. Yeah, um, I think the easy way to say it. Well, I mean, first and foremost, how were the steaks? They're, uh, they're delicious. There you go. And 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 the sausage thing you gave me, and the beef sticks. So nothing survived the two days it's been. Since. No, there's some there's some <laughs> hamburger meat in the in the freezer. <laughs> it's all gone. It was amazing, but we're. Do empty. you see Trevor, Matt, my friends? They <laughs> yeah. all come over for lunch and dinner. Right. In yeah. Jersey, we feed everybody, man. We like to oh, bring 100%. people over food. I, every time I cook, my wife's like, is that enough? Or are you cooking too much? I'm like, no, nah, it's cool. Leftovers are still Guys, cool. you're coming from jiu-jitsu. Right. 100 miles. So there is a lot of labeling claims and marketing nonsense in the food space. Not just meat, yeah. but food in All general. Of it. Yeah. So first and foremost, I would say, if you're shopping at the grocery store, shop the outside of the store. What do you mean by that? Meat, cheese, eggs. Don't shop the inside of the aisles. You don't need to buy mac and cheese. You don't need to buy all the bullshit. So if you're really trying to be healthy, the outside of the store is much better for you and your kids. Mm -hmm. And whole food. I mean, if I think there was somebody that said it's got more than five ingredients. I was like, well, I don't know. But how many ingredients does bourbon have? I, I was actually just thinking that, and I was like, well. I think it's like one or two. No, it's just bourbon. That's all that's left. Um, and it's sanitary. It was alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. It's Cleaned fine. me out. But on the meat side of things or the produce side of things, anything at massive scale is pretty hard to do like we do. Yeah. You know, a, a just great. just doesn't work. Well, it could. Like Snake River Farms, family owned large company they sell beef nationally yeah. they're solid they're we know colonial a lot of market over there. here yeah you know shout out to colonial again they have a lot of the snake river products are delicious yeah and snake river does a good job they're out of idaho solid solid people you get into other companies and it's like coming from australia or it's coming from new zealand or they're putting catchy names on something 
and they're actually not doing any of it. So hold on. So it's coming from Australia. It's coming from New Zealand, but they're able to call it an American product because a lot of these companies, and again, we're not going into any mm -hmm. names specifically, but they say U.S. based. Well, the company could be U.S. based, but for instance, if you're selling burger and the laws are changing, the good news is they're changing some of these laws. So shortly these laws will be amended. It'll be a little Especially easier. Especially if RFK gets in the warehouse with Trump. For sure. Like you can bring product from Brazil because one of the things we have, like imported beef is a big thing in the U.S. And most people say we shouldn't import. Well, the reason we import is we grain finish cattle here in the U.S. 97% of our cattle are, grass, are grain finished. Are you grass or grain finished? We're grain finished. That's how you get What's good the, aging, etc. Oh, that good and different? Does it matter? If you want aging, you really need grain finished. And if you like that buttery marbled flavor, it has to be grain finished. Mm. Uh, I'm not mad at buttery. That could be a whole nother like two hour podcast. Yeah. But generally speaking, if you are importing beef, typically they're importing lean trim from Uruguay or Brazil or wherever because we have excess fat. Because when you feed a grain finished diet, those cattle have so excess fat. So they chop fat it up for the hamburger meat and, and blend it. And they mix it. Yes. But since that product from whatever country changed uh, state in the U.S., it's now a product of the U.S., it's a little that's, dodgy. That that's that's bullshit. I and mean, it's, I think it's and that's being bullshit. taken away. They've changed and I don't the think laws. most like do, do they say that in their marketing? Is that in their disclosure anywhere? No, I, I not actually, at all. I want to do a fucking fireside media on that. Yeah. Like, so is, is it in is it in their description where they got it from New Zealand or Brazil? No, not at all. Because I don't really trust beef coming from Brazil. No offense, anybody who's Brazilian. I just right. I don't. Um, but the other thing is, you get a lot of people in the states that are trying to sell beef and trying to claim it's from this or claim it's from that, but. It's commercial beef out of the big plants that's being sold at a premium because it's more expensive to buy and package, and they're just repackaging. How many small brands sick. work out of the big plants? Uh, a fair number of them. Um, what I would say is be informed. You know, if you look at a website and you're like, man, where do these cows come from? And you can't answer that. Yeah, they're probably from another country. Well, no, they're probably not from another country. They're probably still harvested here, but they're from the big four. They're just repackaged under a premium label. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's still USDA inspected. It's safe. It's, it's clean. It's whatever. But my typical answer is vote with your dollar. If you really want to support a ranch, find a ranch. It doesn't have to be ours. Someone said recently, and I think it was Rogan, he said, if I got to pay $3,000 to have an iPhone made here in America, and I know it's creating American jobs and it's a quality phone, I'm going to buy it. Same thing when it comes to my beef or yep. chicken yep. or anything that's going into my body. Or more importantly, my children's body. Because I, I consider myself like Marty fucked, right? Yeah. My kids now have a new life that they can go live healthier. Lucky Charms, Doritos, all these bad things that were given to us with all these terrible ingredients in it. I've already consumed. Yeah. But now we're more educated. Yep. And, you know, beef is something that I'm pushing on my kids wholeheartedly. It used to yep. be like, you know, have your breads, have your fruits, have your veggies. Like even vegetables nowadays the poison they, they spray yeah. on them i know we need them but you know the poison is worse than the, the benefit coming yeah. from the, the veggies um i hope more people get educated on like what they're consuming um how important it is to learn where their food comes from and especially when it comes to red meat yeah well and the the really cool thing about red meat and the grain finish side especially the grain finishing side imparts a more buttery flavor. It's a more tender chew. Your kids are going to want to eat it more. Mm -hmm. So if you buy grass finished because Rogan hammers on grass finished, you got to buy grass finished. Most kids won't eat it. They don't like the flavor. Is Rogan an investor in your company? Nope. I don't know why. No, we're that. pals with him. But yeah. um, but at the end of the day, if you're buying grass finished beef and your kids won't eat it, or you buy grain finished beef and your kids like it, which one's the better of a win? Like. Get educated, get informed, vote with your dollar. No different, right? Like, if you want to support American, buy American clothing. If you want to, you know. But at the same time, sometimes you got to do what you got to do and financially. You also put toxins in clothing. That's, no, that's for another day. Uh, you want to talk about plastics and underwear? Yeah, dude, it's just everything. It's just, <laughs> I, I've just been awoken to so much and not the woke that they want us to be woke. Oh, I Dude, this has been fun. Yes. Uh, you're a very intelligent guy. You and Kara have an awesome operation. You have great investors. You have good marketing names to run with, uh, good friends and pals like Pete and Jocko and you, know, and, and you guys and us as well. We're, we're a partner in this now, and 
I want to help get you more aligned with the Jersey farmers. Sure. And I want the Jersey farmers to look at things from a different perspective that you are looking at it from. So any Well, of these I know guys, you mentioned you wanted to come to the ranch. Do you load up a tour bus and come on out? I don't know if they're going to leave their ranches here in Jersey. <laughs> they're a little hard-headed. Yeah. But I think I could bring a camera, and I know they're going to watch it. Okay. As much as they may be a hater on it. Well, you guys are welcome all the time, man. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. This has been fun. Cheers. Kudos to you guys, and much success. Cheers.